Rn. So let's make it easy and just look at sets of R2. Now before R1, you basically had intervals. I didn't do anything too crazy and give you weird sets that weren't unions of intervals. So pretty much everything I gave you was an interval. Uh, but now in multiple dimensions, two is easiest to draw. Uh, sets are basically blobs. You can have open sets, you can have closed sets. So let's talk about, so a set of R2. So if you write them in set builder notation, you can write as xy such that uh, with some property or properties over here. So now abbreviating things, S, what is S? Well, that symbol is subset. So S is a subset of R2. So S are sum of the points in R2. <coughs> so let's go for an interior point. All right, so an interior point. So let's pretend like our set looks like a blob. I think looking at this blob, we'd agree that that is an interior point. The other type of point is going to be a battery point. So this point is on the inside. Now, mathematically, how do we say it's on the inside? What we're going to do is say that you can build a neighborhood around it such that the entire neighborhood is inside the blob. So that's what it means to be an interior point. So x in S is an interior point of S if there is a disk disk, we'll call it D oh, D Epsilon XY. All right, so in the world's epsilon, the epsilon is the radius of this disk. So if we look at the disk I drew, of course, oh, what the heck is Y? All right, so this point is x, which is a little hard to label. I'll try to squeeze that label in there. Now this disk has a radius epsilon. I probably should have drawn a bigger disk. Let's do that right now. So x is the center of the disk. <coughs> so the definition, let's go with uh, all y in, all y in, now we're in R2, but this works for any dimension. So I'll just write all y in Rn such that, the distance between x and y is less than epsilon. Now I'm using the letter x to represent, in this case, a point in two-dimensional space, but it could very well be a point in n-dimensional space. So I'm not writing out x comma y, I'm just saying that x has two coordinates right here. So by x, when I say x in s, remember s is a subset of R2. So that means x I could write subset R2 if I wanted to. So x is a point in 
two-dimensional space. So sometimes people write it in bold so you know that it's not one-dimensional right here, so that could work also. But you just have to look at where x comes from, and then you know what it is. So in this case, it's a x is a point, not just a number. So the epsilon disk is right here. It's all y that are within epsilon of the point x. Now, what is this right here? If you want to translate this, Now, if I want to see what is that actual magnitude right there, I need to go down to coordinates and say, all right, x is x1, x2, y is y1, y2. And then I could go down and write square root, subtract things squared, less than epsilon. Some of you don't look very happy. Maybe you want me to do that. I'll do that once. So x has two coordinates in two-dimensional space. It has a first and a second coordinate. Y, right here, we're in two-dimensional space here. So y is really y1, y2. So y minus x is y1, y2 minus x1, comma, x2. which is the point or vector y1 minus x1 comma y2 minus x2. And what is the magnitude y minus x? It's going to be square root. So this means, let's see, we could square both sides. All right, so looking at this, I'm going to switch colors and just give these points. So this is basically, this is the x-coordinate. 1 there means it's an x-coordinate. So that's what it looked like in the good old days, right there. x-coordinate minus some offset, y-coordinate minus some offset, square them both. and. Um, this is supposed to be less than the radius, because we're not including the edge, the boundary of the circle. So this is less than the radius squared. All right, so that's what it looked like back in the day. <coughs> now that looks very ugly, and I think that looks way more elegant. Definitely. So that's why I like to look at that version instead. So this is saying the difference between x and y is less than epsilon, or the magnitude of the difference is less than epsilon. So they're within epsilon of each other. So x is the center. y is any point inside the disk. It needs to be within epsilon of x, the center. All right, so any questions on the disk? All right, so this is an interior point if there is a disk that also is a subset that lives inside of S. So if there is a disk that lives inside of S, centered around X, then it's called an interior point. Uh, the only caveat is that you need to make sure epsilon is greater than zero. 
you don't have a zero uh, radius disk. So I'm just going to write that. Can't have a zero radius disk. And I'll write the word exists here instead of there is. All right, so there's interior point definition. So a boundary point. All right, so first thing to note is that a boundary point has to be an element of S. So any boundary point has to be inside the set S. Uh, now, of course, boundary indicates it's on the edge. So let's draw a little picture of what a point on the edge looks like. I'll go for the bottom edge so it's further away from the disk that we drew before. Now we're still going to make a disk. So with this disk, no matter how small I make the epsilon or the radius, it will have points both inside and outside the set. Just looking at this. Now, if all the points were inside the set, it would be called an interior point. So if I can make this uh, disk small enough and get every single point inside the set, it would be an interior point. So I don't want this to be an interior point. I want it to be an exterior point or a boundary point. Ooh, I shouldn't say exterior. I want it to be a boundary point. So what that means is this point that's super close, I could squeeze in a really small disk and say, oh, it's not on the edge. So what's the difference between these two right here? The boundary point, no matter how small I make the disk, even if it's super small, you get points outside the set. So that's what it means to be a boundary uh, point. So this one starts out a little differently. This says for any positive epsilon, the epsilon disk contains at least one point not in S. So any size disk, no matter how small you make it, needs to have at least one point that's not inside of S. So if we go back and zoom into the almost boundary point, hey look, I found a disk that has no points outside S. So that's what it means to not be a battery point. That's why this, this guy is not a battery point on the bottom. But the one a little more to the right is a battery point. No matter how small I make that disk, basically if you go down to the right, there's going to be that point is going to be not inside S. So that's what makes a battery point versus an interior point. So any questions on that idea? So I drew these like they were in two dimensions, but I defined them like they were in n dimensions. So what I said works for, oh, I said two at the first definition. Let's just write, that works in Rn. So what about the one dimensional case? What do sets look like in one dimension? They're all, they're all points on a line. All right, what does any subset of R1 look like? It's going to be points or an entire interval or a bunch of intervals on the x-axis or the real number line. So let's take what we know about our open set. Let's do an easy open set, 0, 1. How about that? 
Now, if I draw the notation like this, that makes you think that there's points off, off above and below the line. There's no elements or points above and below the line. There is no above and below the line. This is one dimensional. So let's take any value between 0 and 1. Now, this disk is going to be a one dimensional disk. So you can certainly draw the disk in two dimensions, but really, it's a one dimensional disk. So the best way to draw it in one dimension is like that. It just goes a little left and a little right. And how much? That'll be epsilon. All right, so I found any point between 0 and 1. I'm going to make the epsilon uh, small. So we'll say whatever the minimum distance is to the edge, I'll just take maybe a third of that distance, and that's my epsilon. So you know that distance I just measured on the left, I'll just take a third of that, and that's my epsilon. So no problem. Any point in the middle, I can do this too. Well, I, any point on the interior, I can do this too. Now, are the point 0 and 1 included in this set? Nope. So I can't talk about them being exterior points, because the first thing in exterior is you're an element of the set. So 0 and 1 are not elements of the set right here. So open intervals, every point is an interior point. So close set from 0 to 1. Well, this has the same interior points that we had before. So the interior points are the open, or everything between 0 and 1, not including the endpoints. So that, that's the interior points. So all x between 0 and 1 are interior. Are there battery points here? Your intuition should tell you yes. Definitely. So it seems like 0 should be on the left boundary. So how do we show that? We have to show that every, every single disk has points outside. So every single disk that I draw, so here's a disk. Every single disk I draw is going to contain a point that's less than 0 in this case. It's going to contain some negative value. Even if you make epsilon tiny, like 1 over a million, that's fine. I'll just take half that much. So if you say this is negative 1 over 1 million, a lot of zeros, I'll just take half that much. And that'll be the point outside. So no matter how small we make our epsilon, there's going to be a point on the left outside. So x equals 0 and x equal 1 are boundary points. All right, so that's how open and close and these neighborhoods relate to intervals. So if every point of your interval is an interior, you say your interval is open. Um, close is a little more tricky, but if you have a closed set, you'll have the ends will be boundaries. So we're going back into Rn now. So we'll say S is a bounded region if If any two elements, any two points in S, so the 
the difference between any two points are less than some number. N could be huge, N could be a thousand or a million or a trillion. But if there's some maximum such that any two points you take are no further apart than N. So one thing you could do is you could say, well, there's some big circle or big disk I could draw around my entire set if I know there are two, no two points are further than a certain distance. Here is a set or a subset of R2. It's pretty easy to draw out the subset of R2. So I want all xy such that xy equals 1. So I could solve it for y equals 1 over x. We've graphed this function out a lot. Easy to graph. That's what the graph looks like. Now if we take any two points on this graph, Let's take that point right there. Is there a maximum uh, distance I can go away from that point? So if I say a million, can you find a point that's further than a million away from this point? How do we find it? We go up either up really high to a million two, just to be safe, or we go really low to and I'm talking about y coordinate a million and two, or y coordinate negative a million and two. I don't think we even have to go that far negative. Probably negative a million would be just fine. So there's a point way down here, y coordinate of negative a million. So the distance between these two would be, whatever it would be, large, close to a million. No matter what number you think of, though, even if it's bigger than a million, we can go further down and find a point even further down that's further distance than you're thinking. So whatever number you're thinking, we can get a point further away. So this is not a bounded region. Now it's a little strange if you added up the total volume, you would get zero here because it has zero thickness. So we have an unbounded region of volume zero. I shouldn't say volume, I should probably say area in two dimensions. Of course, that is volume zero. All right, so that is bounded region. We'll talk about the boundary operator. So it looks a little bit like a dyslexic 6. It's really called a curly D. Not to be confused with the derivative D, or the regular English D. All right, you're going to find that this operator, whoa, that's totally the wrong operator. Is that what your book uses? Is it the same as the partial derivative? No, it's not supposed to be the same as partial derivative, although that's what's in my notes which is not right, it should be that simple. Oh, delta? Is that in your book? Any other textbook? You may have to look in the index for the boundary operator.
All right, the boundary operator is easy as to describe what it does. It basically throws away all the interior points, or just keeps just the boundary points. So the boundary operator just says, hey, what are the boundary points? I don't care about the interior. So that's the boundary operator does. So the epsilon ball centered at x is all y in whatever dimension space you are, such that x minus y is less than or equal to epsilon. So it's the closure, which I'll say in a, in a minute, but it's the closed uh, disk. So the other one was just less than epsilon, so it didn't include the edge. This one is less than or equal to, so it includes the edge. Easy to draw. You have center, epsilon, and this includes everything epsilon distance away from the center. So battery is included. Any luck finding boundary operator in the book? Oh. Got to be in there. I know. Keep using the the one that I said wasn't the boundary operator. So I'll probably have to start using it as the boundary operator. So I don't think you'll use it for real until Calc four. All right. So we're going to go back to the curly D right here. So it looks just like a six that's backwards. Well, depending on how you write your sixes, but I write my sixes pretty similar to that. In the book, that's what it is? It's like that? All right, so we'll go with that. All right, next definition, C, epsilon x is almost exactly the same, except between x and y is equal to epsilon. All right, so this one is what you call a circle. So it's just the edge of the circle or the edge of the disk, no interior stuff at all. So all the interior is gone. So if I was trying to draw this out, this is everything. You got to shade it in. And then what we just did, C epsilon, got X in the middle, epsilon, it is just the edge. So all the interior stuff has gone. So how are they related? The boundary of the ball is the circle. So if you just take the exterior points of the filled in ball, you get the circle, just the edge. Let's go back up to the epsilon disk, centered at x. Here's what that looks like. What's the boundary of this? It's not a trick question. What are the boundary points? Or are there not any? There's none. So it's the set of exterior points. We write the set with nothing as the empty set right here. So this is the way you say the set with nothing or no elements. Sometimes you'll see it written as two curly brackets with nothing in between them. So you can also see it written like that. Or I guess you call it a set builder notation with nothing built inside of it. So you're just saying it's a set, and what's inside? There's nothing inside of it.
What is the boundary of the closed interval from 0 to 1? What's the boundary? The number 0 and the number 1. So the way we write it, we use set builder notation and list out, hey, there's two things inside. There's a 0 and there's a 1. So this is set builder notation, not to be confused with any interval notation. This is the set of element 0 and 1. limit points of a set S. So S is a subset of Rn again. Now we're getting very mathy. So it says if any disk around X intersects S, if any of that intersection is not empty. So what does that mean? There's at least one element or one point in common to every disk and the set S. That's what it means to be a limit point. So intersecting Venn diagram, if you intersect and there's something in there, that means there's a point in both of the two that you're intersecting. So that's what it means to be, uh, for the intersection to not be empty. There's something in common. Now there could be an infinite number of points in common also, but this is just saying there isn't none. I can use this notation back up in the boundary definition. Let's see. Boundary point. So D epsilon of X contains at least one point not in S. So I could rewrite that. The epsilon disk intersects. So I put a little C up in the exponent of S. That means complement, right there. So I'll talk about the complement operator. Oop, is not empty. There's at least one point that is not an S. All right, so now I need to talk about the complement operator. So the complement, SC, is the whole of Rn that's not inside S. So you could write out SC 
as Rn take away S. So it's everything in your space, your n-dimensional space, that's not an S. So in, it's basically how you negate a set. You say it's everything that's not inside this set. So it negates the set. So if S is logically some uh, X's with properties, properties holding true, S complement is all X's such that the properties are not holding true. Well, I should say at least one property is not holding true. Now, I have to be a little careful about at least one versus all properties not holding true. Ands become ors, and ors become ands when you negate. I don't want to go through a huge lesson on logic, but you have to be a little careful if there's ands and ors. But logically, it's the opposite or the complement. All right, so another way to think about limit points, they are points that are arbitrarily close to S. There are points not in S. Wait, no, they could be in S or not in S, but they're points that are arbitrarily close to S. So in other words, limit points are points arbitrarily close to S. So if we draw some blobby S out right here, if it has a solid boundary, then the limit points are every point on the exterior right here. And actually, and every point on the interior as well, is that right? So it would be every single point inside the set S right here. So if your boundary is filled in, then the limit points are all of S. If your boundary is not filled in, certainly all the points inside are limit points. Any epsilon neighborhood contains a point inside S also, namely itself. So this says all points in S are already limit points. However, what about points? A point on the boundary is not actually in S, but any neighborhood I draw is going to have part of it inside of S. Now, approximately half of it, basically, but there will be a lot of points inside of it inside of S. So here, limit points basically fill in a uh, open boundary. So all of S are limit points. And all points arbitrarily close to S are limit points. Now I say arbitrarily close, what about a point that is right here? So there's some space between that point and the what would be that dotted battery or the open battery. So all you have to do is say, oh, what about that disk right there. I'll just take half that distance and make a disk. And that disk has none of its points inside of S right there. 
So this would be not a limit point. Whereas the other one we drew was a limit point. So now we can properly talk about open and closed sets. So you thought you knew about open and closed sets, but you didn't. So let's talk about what open and closed sets are finally. You saw what open and closed sets are for real numbers. Well, you saw one example of what they are. They were open and closed intervals. That's one example. So a set S of Rn is closed if it contains all of its limit points. So that's the official definition of a closed set. If you got all limit points inside your set, your set's closed. So here's another operator, it's called the interior operator. So it looks like you're taking it to the zero power. And I'm not sure why they use that. Maybe an I would have been a good idea too, but they just use that circle right there. So the interior operator is all interior. points of S. So you can always break down any set into interior points, union, boundary points. And you can solve for the boundary or S naught. So if I solve for S naught, is S take away all the boundary points? So the interior is the set S if you remove all the boundary points. That's the interior. I can solve for the boundary of S, which is S take away all the interior points. So the boundary is S minus the interior, and the interior is S minus the boundary. So S is an open set. if S equals the interior of S. Or another way to think about it, if S has no boundary. I should say another symbols. The boundary is nothing. So if there's no boundary, you say the set is open. All right, so for my least favorite part of math, the empty set is an open set. What's the interior of the empty set? You're thinking too hard. Nothing. Which is the empty set. 
All right, so the boundary of the empty set is nothing or the empty set itself. Now, because it's both itself and also nothing, that also means, uh, so it's an open set. We just showed that one right there. What is the interior of the empty set? There's no points inside there anyway, so that's also nothing. Uh, so you can go with either definition for open set. So it's definitely open. It shouldn't make you satisfy you at all. <laughs> it's what we call vacuously true. And it's actually, I believe, closed. What are the limit points of the empty set? There are no limit points. There's no points close to no points. <laughs> so have a see, the empty set's also closed. So it's also vacuously true that it's closed. Neither of which are terribly enlightening. But those are vacuous truths. Set because it has no limit points. So they're all included in itself. So all none of them are already inside the set. <laughs> all right, just like you could say every I don't know. Every Tyrannosaurus Rex that I own eats people. Well, I don't own any, so it's not a false statement. But also not very helpful. I'm not sure I'd want a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> <laughs>